In this video, we are going to take a look at the periodic table. There we go. So let's start with elements and element symbols. An element is a pure substance that cannot be broken down into simpler substances by a chemical reaction, meaning it's our fundamental building block for all of matter. Um, and when we think of an element in its pure state, we often think of it as just that single atom on its own. Um, so here may maybe be um, some like an element of gold, and we would expect just gold atoms to be together in the solid state. But within matter, we have all sorts of different substances and mixtures that include elements. So elements can combine to form compounds like water, and table salt. Uh, we can also have atoms combined together very similar to our um, pure element, but with a mixture of elements creating a pure substance, or sorry, a mixture that is homogeneous. And we can also have uh, put our piece of gold in some water or find some gold in some water if we're panning for gold. And we would have a pure element here that was part of a heterogeneous mixture. So each element will be identified in this class and in chemistry by a one or two letter symbol. Um, and we'll arrange these symbols on the periodic table uh, to organize information about different elements. Here are a couple examples. Carbon will abbreviate to just an uppercase C. Sulfur will abbreviate to an uppercase S. These make sense, right? Carbon starts with a C, capital C. Um, however, some will make less sense because there are more elements than there are letters in the alphabet. So gold does not have an element symbol that starts with a G. Um, instead, it's AU. And the first letter is always capitalized. And the second letter is always lowercase when we are looking at an element symbol. And this is so we can clearly distinguish where one element symbol begins and another begins. Um, and so if we have a series of elements written out, like if we had gold chloride, we would be able to tell that the AU represented one element and the CL by the other because the A and the C would be uppercase. And any lowercase letters would be part of that element symbol. So here's gold, here's chlorine. And here are a number of versions of the periodic table. The periodic table is just a way to organize information about the various elements that we know about. And lots of people have opinions about the best way to organize information. And so there's actually more than one periodic table out there. And some of these are pretty interesting. Some look like board games. Um, others employ the fun use of hexagons rather than squares. And some look like something out of Star Trek. Um, and these all organize information in slightly different ways, depending on what the creator of the periodic table felt was the most important piece of information about each element. We will use the modern periodic table, and this is the one that uh, we have decided, we as a scientific community use together to organize information. And it'll organize elements by similar properties, and by the same number of valence electrons, which we'll explore later in the lectures um, related to the periodic table and atomic structure. Looking a little bit more at our modern periodic table, this is the version that you'll typically see, but it's really kind of an abbreviation. These lanthanide and actinide rows of elements are actually inserted right here in this space. Um, so that the modern periodic table actually looks like this, and it doesn't fit very well on an eight by 11 sheet of paper. And so since the lanthanides and actinides are um, less commonly used elements, they're very heavy, we take these out and we insert them below 
So that way we can have a more concise version of the periodic table. So let's take a look at this a little bit more. This is um, an example of the periodic table you will have on exams. It'll include element symbols as well as the element name. It'll have the molar mass, and it will also have the atomic number for every single element. And so let's take a look at this a little bit more closely. Um, so again, every single, and this is looking at helium, um, each square on the periodic table will represent one element, and the largest portion of it will typically be the element symbol or the chemical symbol for that element. Some periodic tables will include the name below it, um, and some will not. I prefer that when they do, so you don't have to go hunting, because again, some of these don't make very much sense. Like HG is mercury, and it would be hard as someone new to chemistry to put those two together. Or that, um, there's another word, that W is tungsten. There's not um, a Q based on the spelling of the element, um, what its symbol would be. We'll walk through things like atomic number in detail. Um, atomic number is the number of protons that define the element. And then we also have atomic mass right here, which is the actual weight of one atom, or the mass in grams of one mole of that atom. And we'll discuss moles a lot when we review um, chemical reactions. There's also something that's the group number, and this isn't um, above every single square, but you can find these up here at the tops of each of the columns on the periodic table. And this gives you a little bit of information about the um, number of valence electrons in the elements that are in the column. And so a group will be this entire column of elements, and they'll share a lot of similarities. So we can kind of break up the main part of the periodic table into two groups. The representative elements, which are going to be groups 1, 2, 3A, 4A, 5A, 6A, 7A, 8A. And then the transition metals, which are going to take up this block of um, elements that seem to be kind of like subset in the periodic table. Now we don't have common names for all of these, but we do for a few, and it's, it's helpful to know because people will reference them. Noble gases are the um, last column um, of the periodic table. Next to them are the halogens. This includes elements like fluorine and chlorine and bromine and iodine. We have our alkali metals in our first column of the periodic table and our alkali earth metals in the second. The one kind of exception to this alkali metals is hydrogen. Hydrogen is actually a non-metal. A lot of people like to think of it as being right here on the periodic table, but our modern periodic table will have it here. We'll get into some of these reasons later, but it definitely is a point of, um, demonstrates a point where people might disagree about the best way to organize information on a periodic table. These other representative element groups right here don't actually have a common name. This is because they'll include both metals, nonmetals, and metalloids. Um, and so some of their properties will be different based on which category they fall into. So here are a few properties about each of these types uh, or classifications within the periodic table. Our alkali metals are very reactive. Um, if you throw them in water, they will explode, which is extremely fun. Um, they're metals except for hydrogen, um, and they'll always have a plus one charge. And we'll talk about charge, which is a difference in the number of protons and electrons in more detail in chapter three. These will also react with oxygen to form compounds that'll dissolve to form really basic solutions. And then we have alkali earth metals, which are also reactive, not quite as much, and form plus two ions. Uh, many of these are actually not soluble in water as well. Now our transition metals that we looked at um, are all metals, and they actually have lots of different charges to them, and they can take on a lot of different properties, and so they make for some very interesting chemistry. Our lanthanide and actinides are the ones that are subset down below our periodic table. They tend to 
form plus two and plus three ions, and the actinides are radioactive. Our halogens are that second to last column to the right of the periodic table. They're very reactive, and they will all form a diatomic molecule in the elemental state. What that means is that chlorine will not exist as a single chlorine atom. Instead, chlorine in its element state will be two atoms bonded together. Our noble gases are inert. They do not react with other elements for the most part unless they're very heavy, like um, xenon. Xenon can form bonds with other molecule or other elements. Um, so it doesn't form ions either. And these are all monoatomic gases, meaning that a xenon gas will just be one atom rather than the diatomic like we saw with chlorine. So we can um, extract more information just from an element's location on the periodic table and the way that it's organized. One piece of that is whether or not an element is a metal, a non-metal, or a metalloid. Our non-metals are here in blue on the periodic table, and it's the majority of the elements that are known, um, and they occupy this, this space right here. Um, our nonmetals are in yellow, and there's fewer of them, and they're in the upper right-hand corner of the periodic table. These include things that um, we commonly think of as making up organic compounds like carbon and hydrogen and oxygen. And then in green right here, we have the metalloids. Um, these are elements that have properties that are kind of like metals and kind of like nonmetals. So it, it has properties from both categories. And they fall on this kind of staircase pattern in between the metals and the nonmetals on the periodic table. And that's why you'll see this dark black um, staircase feature in a lot of periodic tables that you'll find. So our, our metals are going to be very lustrous, malleable, ductile. Um, their hardness can vary. Um, they'll conduct heat and electricity well. Um, they'll be solids at room temperature with the exception of mercury. That will be a liquid. Um, and their reactivity varies wildly. Um, sodium will explode where um, platinum will be as reactive. Um, then we have our nonmetals. These are the ones that were yellow in the previous slide. They're typically dull and brittle. They don't conduct electricity and heat. They're insulators. Um, their chemical reactivity also varies. And a lot of these are going to exist as compounds rather than pure elements. So we don't find them as a pure element as often. And a lot of these are actually gases. An exception to this, um, some are solids, um, and only bromine is actually a liquid at room temperature. So then in between these two, we've got our metalloids on the staircase. And their properties kind of go in between metals and nonmetals. So they're shiny, but they are brittle. They're semiconductors, so they'll conduct electricity, but not as well as a metal. Um, some great examples of this are silicon and germanium. Now, the periodic table is huge <laughs> in terms of the number of elements we have. And if we think about the elements that are biologically relevant or that we would care about if we were thinking about um, chemistry from a human anatomy or biology standpoint, it's very few, not very few of the periodic table elements are kind of make up life for us. So in uh, purple, we have elements that are essential for humans. And we can really think of most of our bodies as being comprised of carbon and hydrogen and oxygen and nitrogen and phosphorus. Then a lot of these have other very essential roles, like all of our cell signaling relies on potassium and sodium concentrations. And many of the enzymes that catalyze the reactions that make life possible come from our transition element metals embedded in proteins. There's also some that are suggested but not essential for humans, so that they're, they're important, but they're not something um, as essential. And those are things like our fluorine, a little bit of silicon, um, chromium, nickel, 
And the rest are, are not necessary. We, we don't incorporate them in a way that is required within our body to sustain life. 